In this hands-on tutorial, you'll learn how to implement Data Vault on Snowflake. To keep things simple, we'll use the Snowflake sample data that comes with your Snowflake org to create some of the basic objects that you'll need. We'll also leverage streams, tasks, and Snowpipe to build some data pipelines. You will need your own Snowflake account to complete the tutorial. I'd recommend using a trial account. All the code for the tutorial can be found in the supplemental material section on my GitHub repo for the Snowflake Definitive Guide. The hands-on tutorial is based on the Snowflake Quick Start for Data Vault. In addition to all the SQL code, there is also a diagram I've uploaded to GitHub so that you can always refer back to it while you complete the hands-on example exercise. In order to get the most out of the tutorial, you'll need to have some basic understanding of data vault concepts and modeling techniques. Fortunately, there are some really good resources available for you to get up to speed quickly. A few things to call out before we get started. For simplicity, we'll use the account admin role, but this would not likely be the case in a real production environment. We'll be using the create or replace command to make it easy to go back to any section of the tutorial. However, using create and replace is not recommended for common use in the production environment. We'll be creating two new virtual warehouses for this tutorial, but you can create as many virtual warehouses in varying sizes and configurations that you need. Lastly, at the time of this tutorial, there were 15 million records in the SF10 orders table and 1.5 million records in the SF10 customer table. If either of those numbers is different for you, then you'll have slightly different numbers in the business data vault layer. All right, let's get started. We need to create a new Snowflake database and some schemas to be used in the tutorial. The schemas will be used for a staging layer, a raw data vault layer, a business data vault layer, and in the information delivery layer. The loading and staging layer includes moving the source data into Snowflake. For this, Snowflake has multiple options, including batch load, external tables, and Snowpipe. Snowpipe is Snowflake's managed service for onboarding streaming data. Snowflake allows you to load and store structured and semi-structured data in the original format while automatically optimizing the physical structure for efficient query access. The data is immutable and should be stored as it was received from source with no changes to the content. From a data vault perspective, functionally, this layer is also responsible for adding technical metadata such as record source, load date timestamp, etc as well as calculating business keys. You'll notice that we'll use the Snowflake sample data for nation, region, customer, and orders. We'll perform a one-time data load for nation and region, the static reference data. For the customer and order data, we'll establish pipelines to incrementally load both the JSON and CSV data that we create. The Snowflake sample data for customer and order is what we'll use to store as JSON and CSV data. For nation and region, we'll create two new staging tables and populate those tables with reference data from the Snowflake sample data. You can do a quick validation to see that the data has been stored within the tables. We need to create two new tables to be used by Snowpipe to drop feed the data as it lands in the stage. As a reminder, we'll not load data directly into these tables using SQL like we did with the reference data. For the customer data, the full payload of JSON data will be loaded into the raw JSON column. We'll use the special variant data type for this use case. We'll also add some columns for metadata like load data timestamp, LDTS, and the file row number. For orders data, we'll load CSV data. As such, we'll create the order staging table with the appropriate data types. Next, we'll create streams on the staging tables in order to easily detect and incrementally process the new portions of the customer and order data. We'll be producing sample data by unloading a subset of the data from the TPCH sample data set within the Snowflake sample database that is provided with all Snowflake accounts. 
We'll then use Snowpipe to load it back into this Data Vault tutorial, simulating a streaming feed. For the customer data, we'll use Object Construct as a quick way to create an object from all columns and then offload it into the customer data stage. For the orders data, we'll extract it into compressed CSV files. While there are many additional options in the copy into stage construct, we'll use the include query ID to make it easier to generate new incremental files as we're going to run these commands over and over again without the need to deal with file overloading. Note that we'll also use limit to restrict the number of records we'll be using in this tutorial. I'd recommend you, I'd recommend you take a minute to review the data and how it is stored for the customer data and for the order data. Just as a side note, if you want to see how the data in the customer table differs when it is presented using object construct, here is a quick example for you to take a look at. Here we'll be setting up Snowpipe to load data from files in a stage into staging tables. It is important to recognize that the refresh functionality is intended for short-term use to resolve specific issues such as when Snowpipe fails to load a subset of files. It is not intended for regular use. We're using the refresh in this tutorial to trigger Snowpipe explicitly to scan for new files. In production environment, you'll likely enable auto ingest, connecting it with your cloud storage events like AWS SNS and process new files automatically. You should be able to see data appearing in the target tables and the stream on these tables. As you would expect, the number of rows in a stream is exactly the same as in the base table. This is because we didn't process or consume the delta of the stream yet. Note, it may take a few seconds before the counts are reflected in the table. I'd recommend you pause here and wait until the counts are accurate before proceeding. Next, we'll derive some business keys for the data vault entries in the model. We will model it as a view on top of the stream that should allow us to perform data parsing and business key and hash diff derivations on the fly. You'll notice that we are using SHA1 binary as the hashing function, which is a fairly common thing to do. Let's repeat the same thing for the order data that we did for the customer data. And again, we should take a minute to validate the data. We're now ready to create the raw data vault layer. The raw data vault is a data vault model with no soft business rules or transformations applied. Only hard rules are allowed. Here in the data vault, we'll be loading all records received from the source. In our data vault example, we'll need to build up two hubs, two satellites, one link, and two references for the raw data vault layer. Here are the two hubs, the two satellites, and the one link. Here we're building out the two reference tables and populating these two tables with data. We now have source data waiting in our staging streams and views, and we have target raw data vault tables. We just need to connect the dots. To do that, we need to create tasks, one for each stream, so that whenever we have new records coming in a stream, that delta will be incrementally propagated to all dependent RDV models in one go. To achieve this, we're going to use multi-table insert functionality. You'll notice that tasks can be set up to run on a predefined frequency and use a dedicated virtual warehouse as a compute power. To keep it simple, we'll use the same warehouse for all tasks. Also, before taking up a compute resource, tasks are going to check that there is data in a corresponding stream to process. On this slide, we have the details for the task for the customer stream. We also have the details for the task for the order stream. Let's have a look on the task execution history. You'll notice that the tasks are scheduled. Wait a minute or so, and you'll see that the scheduled tasks succeeded, and they are scheduled for a minute later. 
Wait another minute or so, and you'll see that the second time through, the condition expression for the tasks evaluated to false, so they were skipped. Once again, they are also scheduled for a minute later. Let's check the contents and stats of the objects involved. You'll notice that the views on streams in our staging area are no longer returning any rows. This is because the delta of changes was consumed by a successfully completed DML transaction. In our case, it was embedded in tasks. And this way, you don't need to spend any time implementing incremental detection and processing logic on the application side. One of the great benefits of having the compute power from Snowflake is that now it is totally possible to have most of your business vault and information marts in a data vault architecture be built exclusively from views. There is no longer a need to have the argument that there are too many joins or that the response won't be fast enough. The elasticity of the Snowflake virtual warehouses combined with Snowflake's dynamic optimization engine have solved that problem. If you really want to deliver data to the business users and data scientists in near real time, then using views is the best option. Once you have the streaming loads built to, to feed your data vault, the fastest way to make that data visible downstream will be views. Using views allows you to deliver the data faster by eliminating any latency that would be incurred by having additional ELT processes between the data vault and the data consumers downstream. All the business logic, alignment, and formatting of the data can be in the view code. That means fewer moving parts to debug and reduces the storage needed as well. With Snowflake, you have the ability to provide as much compute as required on demand without a risk of causing performance impact on any surrounding processes and pay only for what you use. This makes materialization of the transformations in layers like Business Data Vault and Information Delivery an option rather than a must-have. Instead of optimizing upfront, you can now make this decision based on the usage pattern characteristics, such as frequency of use, type of queries, latency requirements, readiness of requirements, etc. We're now ready to create the Business Data Vault layer. In this layer, Data Vault objects exist with soft business rules applied. The raw Data Vault gets augmented by the intelligence of the system. It is not a copy of the raw Data Vault, but rather a sparse addition with perhaps calculated satellites, mastered records, or maybe even commonly used aggregations. This could also optionally include point in time and bridge tables, helping to simplify access to bi-temporal view of the data. From a Snowflake perspective, raw and business data vaults could be separated by object naming convention or represented as different schemas or even different databases. Note, a logical data model may contain one or more many-to-many -many relationships. Physical data modeling techniques transform many-to-many -many relationships into one-to-many relationships by adding additional tables. These are referred to as bridge tables. All the work we did to set up the raw data vault layer now sets us up for success in the business data vault layer. As a quick example of using views for transactions, we'll be creating an example of how enrichment of customer descriptive data could happen in business data vault by connecting data received from the source with some reference data. Let's create a view that will perform these additional derivations on the fly. Take a minute to validate the data. Now let's imagine we have a heavier transformation to perform that it would make more sense to materialize in a table. It could be more data volume, could be more complex logic, could be a point in time table, a bridge table, or even an object that will be used frequently and by many users. For this case, let's first build a new business satellite that for illustration purposes will be deriving additional classification or tiering for orders based on conditional logic. Again, take a minute to validate the data. What we are going to do from a processing and orchestration perspective is to extend our order processing pipeline so that when the task populates an L10 RDV SAT order, this will generate a new stream of changes. And these changes are going to be propagated by a dependent tasks 
L20 BDV SAT order BV. This is super easy to do as Task and Snowflake can be not only schedule based, but also start automatically once the parent task is completed. Interesting. You'll notice that the order stage table has a combined 175,000, but the order table in the raw data vault layer and the view in the business data vault layer have 125,000 records, while as we would expect, both the order streams have zero records because they've been processed. Let's try removing the limit altogether and see what happens. Let's go back to our staging area to process another slice of data to test the tasks. We'll remove the limit, which means we expect all 15 million order records to be retrieved. Now that all 15 million records are in the order tables and views, what if we again do another push of records? What do we think will happen? Let's find out. Let's go back to our staging area to process another slice of data to test the tasks. We expect the same full 15 million records will be sent to the staging table. Sure enough, the number of records in the staging table increased as expected. You'll notice that the records in the order table and order view stayed at 15 million. Let's try one more thing just to assure ourselves that we now have a good understanding of how the streams, tasks, and pipes are working. We'll go back to our staging area to process another slice of data to test the tasks. We'll again place a limit on the number of records. With these results, we should feel confident that we've processed the delta and that even if the records get repeated in our stage, these duplicate records will not make their way downstream. And now, finally, we are ready to create the information delivery layer, which is a layer of consumer-oriented models. This could be implemented as a set or multiple sets of views. It is common to see the use of dimensional modeling, such as Star and Snowflake, or denormalize flat tables, for example, for data science or sharing. But it could be any other modeling, such as unified star schema, supernova, key value, document object mode, etc., that best fits for your data consumer. Snowflake's scalability will support the required speed of access at any point of this data lifecycle. When it comes to the information delivery layer, we are not changing the meaning of the data, but we may change the format so that it's simpler for users to access and work with the data. First thing we would like to add to simplify working with satellites is creating views that show the latest version for each key. Now let's create a simple dimensional structure. We'll keep it as views to start, but you already know that depending on access characteristics required, any of these could be selectively materialized. This is the customer dimension view and the order dimension view. And finally, the customer order fact view. Just as we did previously for order data, let's go back to the customer data stage and process another slice of data. We'll remove the limit and thus we'll expect there to be a total of 1.5 million customer records that end up in the customer dimension view. What's really cool is that we can quickly visualize the information delivery results within Snowflake Snowsight. Select the chart option next to results. The simplicity of engineering, openness, scalable performance, intergrades grade governance enabled by the core of the Snowflake platform are now allowing teams to focus on what matters most for the business and build truly agile collaborative data environments. Teams can now connect data from all parts of the landscape. It's even possible to tap into new data sets via live access to the Snowflake data marketplace. The Snowflake data cloud combined with a Data Vault 2.0 approach is allowing teams to democratize access to all their data assets at any scale. We can now easily derive more and more value through insights and intelligence day after day bringing business to the next level of being truly data driven. Delivering more usable data faster is no longer an option for today's business environment. Using the Snowflake platform, 
combined with the Data Vault 2.0 architecture, it is now possible to build a world-class analytics platform that delivers data for all users in near real time. Don't forget to do a quick cleanup to remove your newly created virtual warehouses and database. Because we created all Snowflake objects in one database, our cleanup is simple. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn, as well as on YouTube. I look forward to hearing from you.